My name is Scott Barker, and I'm a former member of the Living Word Cult. In 2018, another former member named Shalom released letters that exposed a sexual abuse scandal that was being covered up by the leadership of the church. Now, I'm working on a documentary all about the living word. Episode two of that documentary is available now here on this YouTube channel, and it dives into everything that Shalom exposed in those letters and the impact that they had. In this latest episode, we see that Shalom's friend Charity helped her bring those letters to the public and ultimately gain an avalanche of support. Now I'm gonna sit down with Charity and dive even deeper into the living word, the beliefs, the culture, and her experience being raised in this modern day cult. The first thing you have to do is to relinquish your own decision making. Dethrone reason. There must need to be a holy brainwashing that, that will come forth in our life. The word is titled, Very Restricted Ministry. We are going to have shepherding by relationship. Where children are essentially raised by assigned non-parental adults who control every aspect of the child's life. There's so many of us that have finally said enough is enough and like this organization is crap. I believe in God, but I do not believe in the Living Word Fellowship as an institution of God anymore. You're instantly positioned as a servant. I'm your shepherd. What does it automatically position you as? A sheep. This is Charity. You were in the video that we released, latest episode of the Living Word Cult documentary, Shalom's letters were released, and it was like this big crazy thing online. And then almost immediately when I started working on the documentary, Shalom sent me these little videos. And they were like these really powerful statements that she was making, like, I can't be silent anymore. And I just like, I was like, this is amazing. What is this? And then I got the other side and I was like, holy crap, it's like even, it's even more <laughs> amazing. And uh, I kind of, can you just kind of bring me back to that like first time when Shalom, I mean, we, we have it for like a moment in the video. She's like, I'm gonna do something about the church. Like what was running through your mind um, at that point? Well, we had just like recently reconnected cause we used to be very, very close. She was in my wedding. Um, but then, you know, the distance, we kind of lost touch for a little bit and we were only in touch peripherally. And when I left the church, you know, when you leave the church, my cat, when you leave the church, it's like you run the risk of people that are still in, like never talking to you again, especially like if you go quietly, maybe they will, probably they won't. But if you say anything negative, um, they will be told to cut you off completely. And so she, when we reconnected and we started video messaging each other on this app called Marco Polo, which is the, which are the videos that you used in the documentary. Um, so we were kind of like tender footing around it, you know, um, just saying, well, I'm not going to the church anymore and just kind of carefully putting it out there and, I don't remember which of us said it first, but then it became clear that we were both out and that we were both uh, angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so you were like afraid. You were afraid of saying, uh, "I don't believe in the Living Word Fellowship anymore," and then Shalom just being like, "Oh, bye." Yeah. Was that like, yeah, because you didn't know where she stood. Exactly. And I think she felt the same way because we were both a little careful at first. Um, I mean, we had always expressed in the in the past to each other in confidence, especially when we we're close. Like, you know, I, that's how I knew about the stuff about Rick that she had gone through um, the harassment because we would talk about those things. But it was always like you had to be really careful who you told uh, because you would get told on, you know, like someone that you maybe thought you could trust would then go to the shepherds and say, oh, Charity's saying all this stuff about Rick. That actually happened to me and I got in trouble. <laughs> um, but that's a whole other story. So yeah, we were being really careful. But then when, so it was in the course of that, that was summer of 2018, I think that we started sending those videos. And um, I had just started posting on the cult education forum under an alias, which that's pretty much like 99% of people would post under an alias. And that was my way of like 
getting my voice out there, even though I was anonymous. I just thought if I can really, because that forum helped me to see that I wasn't, you know, mistaken that this place was really toxic and messed up. And I just started sharing a lot of the the things that I had experienced. What What is that forum? Can you explain it just a little bit? It's an online forum that's been around for years. And there are threads. It's called the Cult Education Forum. It's run by Rick Ross, who is like a cult expert. I guess he's written some books. And there are threads that people can start about different, you know, cults, churches, and someone had started one about the Living Word Fellowship, I think like 20 years ago. And we were warned, you know, don't ever read this site. It's out there. It'll like contaminate you, basically. It'll poison you to the church. But I remember when I first started really having serious doubts, I was like, started reading things, you know, and going, well, none of it's untrue, but it's that whole cognitive dissonance thing, right? Where I couldn't quite, I wasn't ready yet to accept that this thing that I had been born and raised in and given my life to was the horrible thing that I think deep down I knew it was. How long did you sit there and read it before you realized like maybe these people aren't cuckoo bananas or whatever and like I should actually believe them? The first time I looked at it was in um, I think 2007 and I didn't leave the church until 2016. So it was a process. Um, it was really scary to me, you know, but there was something, it was the first time it was, I was newly married and living away from one of the churches for the first time. And that's when I started to gain perspective and start to see and start Googling things like signs you're in a cult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Every> box, <laughs> right? <laughs> I know I've done the same thing where you look at it, there's like, 10 or so or whatever. And you're just like, Oh, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Um, so this, you were messaging Shalom on this app and sending little videos back and forth. That was 2018. That's two years after you say you left the church. And in those videos, you're like, I'm afraid of these people still, you know, what, what, where does that come from? You know, you're not a part of the church anymore. What's the, what's that about? Well, for one thing, I still had family in the church, um, my in-laws and close friends. And I was afraid of causing trouble in my own family. Um, there was just kind of this unspoken, I don't know. I just didn't feel like I could really be honest with them because they were so involved and I didn't think they would be supportive. Um, And when I started posting on the cult education forum, there was somebody else that was posting on there who, I mean, and anyone can dig it. If they dig enough, they can find this information. But she, the someone in the church who monitored the forum, which we know they did, um, someone found out who she was, her real identity, and she was sent an anonymous threatening letter. And it wasn't like threatening her life or anything. I just, I don't, it was really creepy though. And I don't remember exactly what the specific threat was, but it, it was scary to all of us. It was like, really, what lengths are they willing to go to to keep people silenced? Yeah. Um, it's like a physical letter that they sent. Yeah. Right? It was postmarked yeah. from Honolulu, Hawaii. Yeah, Honolulu is the where Gary, where Gary was based, and Gary in Maryland. Yep. Yeah, at the time. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's those kind of things. Even I I know the letter you're talking about, and it um, it's it's just really even just saying the simple fact of we know who you are, we know what you're saying and um, we know how to get to you yeah. is terrifying in itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's, hard to, it's hard to overcome that stuff. Well, it's also, too, it's also the, the, the extreme emotional and mental abuse that they put us through. It's like that, even though, you know, rationally you think they can never physically hurt or they're not likely to physically hurt me but they have always had the power to 
crush me emotionally and mentally. So I didn't know if they would launch some kind of smear campaign, that sort of thing, or just attack you in some way, if that makes sense. It's really hard to explain. I mean, you understand because you were a part of it, but. How did you overcome, you know, the because I know you also eventually shared things um, publicly with your name attached to it. Um, how do you how how did you overcome that? How did how did you help? I mean, did you help Shalom at all, or was she just like like a train happening without anybody? <laughs> she she definitely needed a lot of emotional support and encouragement. And and to be honest, I was terrified for her at first. I mean, you watched all the videos. I was like, I I'm I'm scared for you to do this because I don't know what these people are capable of. And I felt that based on history that it wouldn't change anything and then she would just get hurt in the process um and so i remember at one point and and this isn't in the marco polos i don't know why but i was like well maybe we should just recruit a bunch of people to like post on the forum and you could post all this on the forum anonymously and she was determined like no i, I have to do this i mean i couldn't sleep at night for months just knowing this is she felt she had to do that and so i said okay like i will support you and initially all she asked was that i just even post a comment um on the post like hey i believe you i support you and i will say i never got over the fear because the day that she was planning to post she's like okay i'm posting it today like be ready and i I was physically shaking when I posted. Like, I was at school, I was, um, I had agreed just to say I believe you, but there's something came over me where I was like, I have to do more than that. I mean, she's putting it all out there. She's putting everything on the line and like, the least I can do is tell my part too and just kind of be um, fearless and that was, where I said, this is not the conduct of a church. This is the conduct of a cult. I just flat out said it. I don't know <laughs> how I found the courage. It was that day that I decided what I was going to say. Yeah, that wasn't, uh, uh, at that time, the Wikipedia didn't say that it was a cult. The church had done everything in their power, which hiring PR firms, all sorts of stuff to suppress anything negative. And the only place that the church was called a cult was the cult education form. So they kind of contained it to this like 1990s era website with like forms and stuff and <laughs> told all of their followers, do not go onto that, that site. What you, what Shalom did posting that, you know, to Facebook, it put it in a place that everybody actually was a very accessible spot. And then making a declarative statement like that, that's, that's terrifying because I mean, what would you have done had there been little to no reaction? Like, you know, if it got two shares by like a few blowouts or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I really didn't know. I, I, I just stopped caring at that point. I, I, all that fear that I had inside, I just, I guess I transmuted it into like just this drive for justice like I, I couldn't hold it in anymore i was tired of being afraid of these people you know and shalom she was really smart to like gather there were a few of us i was the one that she confided in first and we like talked about all this but then she there were a couple other people that she talked to uh and and hoped that they would do the same asked like hey will you will you do this too will you support me and they said yes so there was like a little group of women who had agreed ahead of time to do that, which I think was really important because there were some very powerful stories right off the bat that got people going, oh, this isn't just an angry blowout. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's essential for, for that, I think, uh, too, is to have a lot of other people. And that definitely, you know, that's the thing that you see in there is just comment after comment, just like the same the same type of manipulation, even though it ended up in different places, it's that same system, the same, the same thing that the shepherds did in the, um, leadership. Um, I, 
I mean, tell me what was your what was your reaction in those in those days that followed when you did see all of those stories come out and the huge overflow, and then the and then what happened after the fact with um, you know people being uh, like Scotty and Rick being set out of the church and um, the apology letters, Gary resigning and those things like what what did that what was that how did that feel what was that like i mean i was shocked actually i would i i think it was just everyone was ripe for that moment you know people who were still in the church that were just drowning in in doubt but and desperate for someone to validate their feelings about it and so it just like need they needed that little push um i was relieved because it was actually having the effect that she had hoped it would that people were really like believing and seeing and sharing and like hey let's just get all this truth out there the weird thing was if you recall that like gary had already ousted rick before shalom uh released her letters and so i remember us talking about that like well what is this gonna do now? But it, it you know, the, the problem was so much bigger than Rick. And that was something that, you know, she incorporated into her letters, thankfully, but I still am shocked that it all happened. So you, so tell me about those, the, your, your post around this time and your, uh, what were you, what did you mention in your 360 letters um, or your 360 letter to Gary, like, can you go into that a little bit and talk about the things that you saw independently that you felt um, were, you know, shady on the side of the church or Rick or whatever? Well, one of the first things I said was like the Rick, Rick, Rick is a huge problem. Um, you know, he's a sexual predator. He's extremely inappropriate. He uses people's tithe money. Like it's his slush fund to put on his little productions and, I worked for him. I think I mentioned this in the letter. I was Rick's assistant for like a year when I was 19. Um, and he would just spend like half the day in his bathrobe playing solitaire, like getting paid church money, church tithe money. He was on salary. I made like $800 a month, you know, barely surviving. He didn't do anything. Um, and I, I think I mentioned that, specifically the bathroom thing. I mean, I had already mm -hmm. left. I didn't have anything to lose. I wasn't trying to sugarcoat anything. And then the hierarchical structure of the church, how it was like all the people in leadership were treated like royals, you know, and the rest of us were these peons that were there to serve them, even in the way that VIP functions happened or um, when we would have... The what? The VIP, they would have like oh. VIP events where it was just like the important people were invited and then the rest of us were hopefully asked to be servants at this party because that meant that you were like, you know, approved of. <laughs> um, and even at like Shabbats where they had, because I mean, we were a non-denominational Christian church that celebrated the Jewish holidays. How confusing is that? <laughs> That's probably cultural appropriation. <laughs> yeah, de Gary definitely, definitely was a borderline cultural appropriation, if not like over the edge. He oh, was wow. all into it, like everything that he possibly could while still holding on to Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> like in the in the Jewish traditions, he was just like, let's do all of them. <laughs> it was very confusing, you know, it's like. What yeah, it was. How do you even explain that to people? Um, but I my recommendation was one that they they get rid of that structure i was like it should be it shouldn't be like a pyramid where there's you know the people on top and the people on the bottom um it should be more there it should be more egalitarian and there was an abuse of power like people in leadership had the people they shepherded doing things for them at like cleaning their houses cooking their meals babysitting their kids all for free in the name of learning submission and discipleship and all this stuff, I was like, you need to stop that. That's this abuse of power all the way. Yeah, I mean, that's, t let's talk about that a little bit. The, um, 
the pyramid stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was called all sorts of things. Like, what's the first time that you started getting involved in that or you recognized that that was like something that was part of the church? Well, when I was a teenager, it was when they were first like calling it designated relationships. And I remember like as a teenager having to submit things to my shepherds, like, could I take ballet classes or could I do that? You know, dumb stuff like you had to get permission for. When I was in my early 20s was when it got super fanatical. And that's when the whole Elijah, Elisha thing came out where it was like everybody was supposed to have um, a person over them to submit to. And... <laughs> That's it just got really weird from there. And that's when a lot of that serving came in where you're I don't even remember which one is Elijah is the boss is the boss one. <laughs> I, I every time I have to look it up, I think Elijah is the boss. This is why we were Maybe. like blowouts. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes exactly. Sometimes it's easier just to because they had a bunch of different names. Yeah. Um, so you could choose one, and like one of the ones that was around that same time was Christ in the flesh. Yes. And so you could just you could just submit to Christ, and this person was supposed to be, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus wanted to tell you if you could go to the movies with your friends or not. <laughs> yeah. And you're like very what? convenient, a very convenient way to organize. You know. Uh, your connection with Jesus and get the the rules down perfect. You're right. like, I checked with Jesus for every single thing that I did. <laughs> I went to like, is this movie okay? Can I go see this movie with these specific people? <laughs> well, and it's, I mean, it's silly, like those little things, but the big things that we were told we should submit, these were like m major decisions in our lives that we had no control over, like who we could date, who we could marry, where we could live. Should we go to school? Shouldn't we go to school? I was in, they really frowned upon higher education or like poo pooed it. I was encouraged by Gary that, you know, oh, you don't need college. You should just drop out and learn how to become a really good secretary. I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> good. I have two degrees now, Gary, so. <laughs> Heck yeah, that's awesome. Shalom in the letters. She very clearly, in like the least clear way possible, just to go a little tangent, the. The section of um, explaining, you know, she's she wrote a letter, the Gary Maryland letter, the second letter, two thousand three. Um, she's going back and forth about like I want to date somebody, and all these shepherds are are getting in the way of that. They're you know telling me this and that and whatever. When we were trying to make this video, we wanted to include that in there, but it is so confusing that it was like we couldn't, <laughs> you know, That's and really, but confusing in the sense of the concept of how controlling they were about it, or. Yeah, it's just so many people are involved. Yeah. And I didn't want to overwhelm the audience and like, you know, well, it's this person and then this person and this person. And then because that's if you read it, Shalom's like, I went to this person. Here's my this is my designated relationship. And I said, I want to date this person. And and she was like, OK, I'm going to go talk to his designated relationship and we're going to decide if you guys should date. And then after we come up with a conclusion, which is no, Shalom appeals the decision and yeah. goes to the shepherds ahead. And there's four. There's three people. And they're like, well, you know what? We're not sure about this. Let's bring in Rick and Scott. And then they come in. So now we got seven people involved in trying to decide if Shalom can date this this guy. And they're going back and forth in it. And then like, you know, and so it's all this whole confusing mess. And like, I just was like, that is the perfect example of how designated relationships worked and shepherding, especially when it comes to dating. It's too confusing to explain. So let's see if we can talk about it a little bit and make it. That's never made confusing. sense to me. I mean, like pre, I think I was in junior high, maybe almost high school age when they even allowed people to date. Cause there was this whole, you were too young to, to remember, but maybe you've heard there was a long period of time where people, even adults, it were not supposed to date. Like, how do you find a mate or be a normal human being and not be allowed to date? And then there was this whole word sermon that came out and it was on video where Gary and Marilyn are saying, oh, well, we don't know where this directive ever came from. And, you know, telling all the singles that they could now date. And so then suddenly it was allowed. And that was when I was coming into like, what should have been dating, normal dating age, but. Yeah, you're talking about um, Gary, and, Gary and Marilyn talk to the singles. Yes, 
yeah. Let's pair these things together a little bit. Girls Turn It Off, Gary and Marilyn Talk to the Singles. These are two things from the top directing, you know, how you relate to people and the relationships you're supposed to have and how you're supposed to date and fall in love and all that stuff, especially as a woman with Girls Turn It Off. Like, what did those things say? What were they trying to tell you? That if you got attention from a man, whether wanted or unwanted, it was your fault or because of something you did. Um, I don't recall men ever being held responsible for anything. Like we were, it was the women who were pleased about how we dressed. Um, and if we were perceived to be too flirtatious or having a seductive spirit, you know, and I, I feel like that's a lot of why Shalom was targeted because she's very beautiful and her personality is such that like, you know, she's outgoing and super friendly and kind and just warm. And that would be perceived, I think, because she was, you know, a beautiful, sensual woman. And then like that was perceived as her putting, as they would call it, putting her spirit out there. Because like on that Girls Turn It Off thing where Marilyn just says, you just pull it in and you become nothing. So it was almost like I was told that. I remember we had these weekly Shabbat dinners and I was told by my shepherd, this woman, that I had purposely dressed provocatively to get the attention of the man that I liked because that's the one that I had been dating and we had been split up. I was wearing like jeans and like a white peasant blouse. Like it was nothing. But, and then another time she said that I was talking too much and trying to get his attention. And so then I just, the next time that dinner rolled around, I wore a dumpy sweatshirt, dumpy baggy sweatshirt. And I didn't say a word the entire time. And she said to me after, you were exactly how I wanted you to be tonight. So it was wow. that whole idea yeah. that a woman is just, don't be anything. Yeah. So least, that's what, <laughs> sorry, what was, what was that? Least of all a woman, don't be a woman. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's a perfect example of like the word made flesh. Uh, I can't think of a better way to say it. Like, that's the directive. And where did that, that, you know, what I find interesting, and you can just tell me what your thoughts are on this, is that, you know, that recording of Marilyn that was made pre-Gary um, during John's time, but, you know, that's, that's Marilyn saying that. Did that, how did that affect you, you know, hearing those things, not necessarily from the men as directly, but hearing it from oh, well. you know, Marilyn. I always say that like, even the female leaders in the Living Word Fellowship were misogynistic because they were. It was like they hated women and they um, definitely hated women who were at all <laughs> womanly. <laughs> I still to this day like, second guess things I put on, you know, like, and I have to catch myself and go, it doesn't matter, Charity, like you can wear whatever you want because I don't want to be seen as being, you know, out to get something. It, it was, it's just a very weird psychology and where it got extra confusing was where, especially in LA, we were told, you know, to be modest and like keep our spirits in and whatever. But then we were hypersexualized by the men in the church, both our peers and the leaders. You know, like I remember Rick, I was 19 years old, getting out of a hot tub in my bathing suit and him like commenting on how cute my butt was. And it's like things like that where you're just like, wait, I, for one, that's really uncomfortable for a 19 year old. And he's like, you know, tw at least twice my age. But just to be told, or like during the amphitheater show rehearsals, um, we were dancing and so we were in dance clothes 
And at one point they told all of the girls that we couldn't wear short shorts anymore, like spandex shorts, because we didn't want to be like a stumbling block to our brother. And the, the young men my age, you know, in my early 20s and late teens, probably uh, in LA, in the church there, like we, they were always making sexual comments to us, really inappropriate things. So imagine how confusing that is when you're just like forming your identity as a young person and your sexuality and all that. And it's like, okay, so I'm being hypersexualized, but I'm not supposed to be sexual and and yeah, then it's like you can't can't go either way. Yeah. And then to find out, you know, it's like to know we're being told, don't have sex, don't do this, don't do that. Meanwhile, Rick is having like multiple affairs, each with the younger woman each time. And the leaders were doing all kinds of crazy shit, mm-hmm. sexual shit. <laughs> yeah. And it's especially confusing when... Uh, you know, Rick's out here doing all this stuff and and his mom is the one like saying, you know, you can't behave this way. Um, I mean, what type of, what type of, did you know, did you like, per, not, I know not very many people personally knew Marilyn very well, but like were, you interacted with them, you clean their house, all that kind of stuff. Like, and just from the general culture, like what kind of person was she? What type of woman was she? You know, if she's telling people to be nothing, was she walking in her own words? No. I mean, she yeah. was the queen. And she was very beautiful. And, like, I mean, look at that clip in the episode two that you just produced. Like, her walking across the stage, like, she's the queen bee. And then saying, and you're mine. She used to say that to me. And I know she said it to others. You're mine and this possessive quality to her. Um, But it was like she wanted to be the only one that was like allowed to be however she wanted to be, you know? I don't know, it's weird. Still confusing. It is weird. I don't know if you had much experience with like doing uh, chores and things like that for, like why don't you just a little bit about that? I had, I mean, a couple of different shepherds during that whole thing that, and when I was living in LA, I was a part of a a group that would often be chosen to do things for Gary and Marilyn themselves. So keep in mind, Gary and Marilyn had at least one assistant on paid staff, I think maybe two. And then we were still being asked to volunteer our time to clean their house, to do their shopping, to make their meals. So I uh, was part of that crew that would um, make their meals and clean their house. Um, so my, what is that, what does that crew look like? Like, how did you get recruited into that? Were there tryouts? I missed it. <laughs> there were no tryouts. No, it was just like, oh, okay. I think, and I, I know I can't mention certain names, but the person who Marilyn had put in charge of her, of that stuff, like would ask certain ones of us that were under her control. So again, the hierarchy. So we were submitting to this woman and she was, being directed by Marilyn. So, and it's kind of that. And you didn't get like a, you didn't get like a shirt or anything that said like. Staff. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Marilyn staff. (laughs) Yeah. No, sadly, no. (laughs) Okay. Um, Okay. Go, go on. So, so that's something that, uh, that you, you ended up like doing with your free time. And that was a, this person was this your designated relationship, this person that was right underneath Marilyn, or was this like a separate? Yeah. Okay. And when I was still in Shiloh, when those words first came out, I had um, different uh, shepherds designated relationships. And yeah, I, get, I did tons of free labor for them. Um, I don't know. What? Go ahead. Marilyn Farms stuff. I don't know if I can mention that stuff, but oh, please mention Marilyn Farms. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what. Uh, yeah, go go. Did t- please tell me about that? Because that was a that was a for profit. That was not part of the church. That I mean, was a separate. That was technically. I mean, oh, they they, said, it, we, where did that money even go? I don't know. But I w- I was by my designated relationship directed to 
provide labor for that, making the tinctures and all the weird crap, um, packaging the orders and shipping them. And um, I did a lot of work at the Maryland Farms house, you know, weeding and... Yeah. <laughs> okay, I want to I wanna hear more about it. I'm going to dig as much as I can on Maryland Farms. I'm very interested in Maryland Farms. It's kind of like a black hole for me um, in terms of like the information, especially because it was just out in Iowa and so I didn't have experience with it. From my perspective, Maryland Farms was just the church. Like I didn't realize until now that it was a for-profit company that was owned by Maryland and possibly others that owned separate land from Shiloh. It was adjacent land, but it was separate and they were making money. The way that it looked from my perspective is Gary would get up on stage, he'd say, it is the word of God to buy this tincture. Uh, this is how you're gonna heal your body. You heal your body with this tincture, you'll heal your soul or spirit or whatever. Um, just as like a quick sum up, but it was a little more complicated than that. But um, them asking you to, or directing you to provide free labor for that for-profit company is not okay. Right. Um, and can you tell, especially since you worked for them, somebody that has no idea what Maryland Farms is, what is Maryland Farms? You know, it's kind of unclear to me too. I, it started out as like this weird thing. I think it was in the 90s where they bought all these exotic animals that most of them ended up dying because they weren't meant to live in Iowa, through Iowa winters. Um, I Name an exotic animal, like what type of exotic animal? Eland, which I think they're native to Africa. So, I mean, you don't have to be the smartest person to, to, <laughs> to guess that they might not survive in, in Iowa, but. <laughs> um, and then it was like this whole idea of sustainable uh, organic farming and I think there was, gosh, I don't know. It was after, so I learned later that cults are notorious for starting weird diet crazes. It started out in the 90s with this diet called the McDougal diet. It was these McDougal people who wrote, I think it was called like Diet for a New America or something. And Gary and Marilyn got really into this and then started preaching about it. And everybody went on that diet, everybody. And that years later seemed to kind of evolve into this whole like fixation on holistic health and um, organic eating and all these supplements that they, oh, you're gonna love this. They then started producing at Maryland Farms. Prior to them producing like these tinctures and all this stuff, my dad was making them because he would got really into that stuff. My dad was making and selling these tinctures and a representative of Maryland Farms came to him and said, hey, we're gonna start making these now. So we in good faith wanna offer you like a little bit of money, um, you know, to, to pay you off to stop making yours and selling them. And my dad was like, well, what if I don't wanna stop? And they were like, well, we're gonna do it anyway. So, you, and you're not allowed to sell them. So either take the money or take nothing. But basically he was forbidden from from selling them himself. And I know that happened to a couple who was making tinctures in LA as well. Wow. So that they, so that Maryland Farms could make all of the money. Yeah. Yeah, so they put him out of business and just yeah. kind of strong-armed him off the, did he take the money or did he? Uh... I don't remember, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they could have yeah. But then, you know, they started peddling all these products at, at, at summer camps. They'd have a big table out with all the products and, you know, preaching that, yeah, you, you should take all these things. And people did. Uh, you know, one thing that I noticed and I mentioned to you earlier was the, um, you know, swearing and stuff, which is fully justified in swearing in in the video and your response to everything. But it just reminded me of how uh, not Christian or typical Christian everybody in the church was, where swearing, drinking, you know, this stuff uh, wasn't, was not frowned upon, it was encouraged, people would swear up on stage on, from the altar. Um, what, what do you think, just, I mean, whatever on that topic or whatever, like the culture of the Living Word Fellowship was different. What do you think that was about? Well, I remember Marilyn playing it herself that it was like supposed to be 
uh, eliminating the quote unquote religious spirit. Like they kind of esteemed themselves for not being religious, like other organized religions, that it was more about this spiritual walk with God and it wasn't legalistic. Um, but it wasn't consistent there either because they were legalistic about certain things, like they were anti-gay, they were um, anti-premarital sex, they were, you know, there wasn't anything liberal about their beliefs or their system except for the cussing and the drinking and alcoholism in the LA church was like rampant. I mean, they had bars built at the church. <laughs> What was that? Just expand on that a little bit. Where were their bars? What was that about? Well, Rick had bars built like um, in one of the side rooms, basically at Church of the Living Word. And they would even during services, they'd be like in there serving up drinks and, you know, getting drunk. And then they'd have parties. Eventually, he had a bar put in at Shiloh. At Marilyn's funeral, I saw it for the first time and everyone was just completely obliterated. <laughs> just drunk on wine. Wait, so you went to Marilyn's, I guess that was 2015. So you were still a part of it. Barely. Wasn't that invite only or you had to like pay for, what was the deal? With I'm that? the one <laughs> out of that on the cult education part. Um, yeah, that was like, I was on my way out the door, but I still had this weird thing with Marilyn where like, I still felt really, I was still very disillusioned by her and still um, thinking that she was something better than what she was. Um, but going to that funeral really like sealed the deal for me wanting to leave and being like, this is crazy shit. Cause yes, we were asked to pay $40 a head to attend. And then when we were there, it was like that whole hierarchy VIP thing they had it all at the graveside. Well, at the ceremony in the church, it was like all the special people were up front, not just like her family, but the leaders of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. And then they all like were a part of the processional coming out. And then at the graveside, they had it cordoned off, like literally with like that theater rope stuff, you know, like red carpet. Like a VIP rope at a club or something. Yeah. Exactly. And only certain people, they had a little guy with a little list, like, oh, you're not on the list. Like you can't come sit down. So there was just like standing room only for all of us who weren't, didn't make the cut. <laughs> uh -huh. And then Rick did this weird, um, 21 gun salute, which I found really inappropriate. Like that's what you do at a veterans, you know, funeral. And he did it. Yeah, that's, your husband wasn't, was he there? Yeah, I looked at him and was like, do you find it offensive? <laughs> he was like, I don't know. But later he said, once he was out from under the the whole thing, he's like, yeah, that looking back, that was like really inappropriate. Oh, wow. So they actually had the 21 guns. It was done with firework booms, but like 21, boom, 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 to represent like, yeah. With fireworks, of course. Yes. Rick's like Just bread. like, yeah, Rick's firework show. This Disney wannabe crap. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> That's so stupid. It was uh, so the so the religious spirit. I mean that. You know, from my perspective, I hear I hear that kind of stuff, and like you know, just these these blurred lines, um, not being legalistic. Was that excuse ever used, or did it play in your head, or anything? Um, when you know Rick would comment on you, or you know, in that world. And you can even also explain like, you know, the, the contrast that you're seeing, you're talking about here from Iowa, which is like really conservative to LA, which is, you know, still conservative in some ways, but then like, this is where like all the more nutty stuff happened under Rick's domain. Yeah. Um, what did you see like with that, you know, in there that that, affect you? How come you didn't say something when Rick would comment? I actually no one else would say anything. I did. Um, well, actually, I was only 19 when that the butt comment happened. And there were two other women in the hot tub. Um, 
And they were upset by it because they knew his history and they were worried about me, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. So they went to one of the leaders and said, hey, like, we're concerned that, you know, Rick made this comment. And basically they were told to shut up and not worry about it. Um, <laughs> they were silenced. And then, mm -hmm. so I was still working for him at the time. And then um, I was working for him when he was married to wife number three, who he had a child with. And that's when his fourth wife, who was, I don't know, maybe 16 at the time, was coming around a lot. And there was some weird, something weird going on. And Rick's wife knew it and I knew it. And she, his wife came to me and crying said, you know, please just stay close to Rick because I trust you. Stay close to him and keep her away from him. Keep him away from her, which is a lot to put on someone my age. Yeah. So I confided in my parents, like, I don't know what to do with this, you know, because his third wife was worried he was having an affair again. And um, my parents told somebody who ended up telling Gary and Marilyn, it was this whole thing. Um, I also had told somebody in Shiloh who was concerned about it, but it got back to Rick that I had been saying something and he accused me of being a web spinner. Um, Who accused you? Rick? Rick. It got back to him that I had been talking about it, worried about it. Mm -hmm. So I got silenced there too. <laughs> yeah. There are people in this, in that were around that saw what was happening and tried to do the right thing. And this is, you know, 10 years before Shalom's letters, more, 15 years, something like that, whatever, before Shalom released her letters. And, um, so obviously Gary and Marilyn know about this. Um, what, why was nothing done? That That's where I get really confused because apparently this young woman was moved to Shiloh to get her away from him. And then the next thing I knew, because I had moved back to Iowa from LA had gone back to school, was doing my own thing, as the church liked to call it when you were semi blown out. Um, and then she, she was here for a year or maybe longer, and then suddenly she was back in LA, and nobody knew, like why, but she was living in Rick's guest house, Rick and his, his third wife's guest house. And what I had been told later was like that because I had said something that she got moved to Iowa, that was because I had said something, but then suddenly she's back in LA I, and then I moved back to LA. This is like kind of a wild <laughs> maze uh -huh. of the story. And she was working for him as his assistant and living at his house. And I was like, this is weird. And a lot of people were having suspicions I again went to my designated relationship, my shepherd, and I was like, I feel like something weird's going on. And she basically told me, mind my own business. Mm -hmm. And then not long after that, Rick and his fourth wife are together. Uh, what's what's interesting to me is, you know, all of this, the confusion and stuff, but the, she, you know, you say something and people are worried about it. So instead of like saying, hey, Rick, stop, or like you're fired or something, it's the solution is to move her yeah. to Iowa, you know? Yeah. And then obviously it doesn't stick um, and gets worse. You know, she moves in with him. That's, it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff that's like, it's very, it's very obvious that they knew about it. But what's, a big question for me that like arches over everything is, you know, it, it raises, it raises like these doubts of like Gary and Marilyn are pure channels of God, or they're actually doing something that matters or, or Rick is, you know, an anointed, whatever creative person, whatever these titles were, whatever the story was that they were telling us, does it to you, you know, do you think that these people, knowing what you know now, 
do you think that they actually believed any of the stuff that they were putting out there? I honestly don't know. I, I, I don't know if it was conscious on their part or if they were just so like delusional and drunk with their own power. I really don't know. That's something I think about a lot. I don't want to believe that like they were doing this all like um, maliciously. I think they're just crazy. <laughs> But I really don't know because there's so many things that I found out, you know, after Shalom's letters and other people started spilling the tea, things that it was so much worse than I even knew what things that Gary and Marilyn were doing and that, that John Stevens had done. It was so bad and so corrupt. So I have to wonder, like knowing the things I know now, it does make me lean towards thinking they knew what they were doing and it was all about the money and the power mm -hmm. but i really don't know what was what was who who was rick to you like if you back in the 20s like where to somebody were to ask you like what his role was who who was he how like, did you see him you know i don't know because like i had a different relationship with him doing the shows and all that stuff and i i thought he was cool and like real liberal in in um in terms of like you know not being legalistic or religious but i also found him to be like the equivalent of a spoiled child that can do does whatever he wants gets whatever he wants um you know for a long time i i really liked him i looked up to him i i thought he was fun but there were so many things that being as young as I was, I just, because I didn't understand them, I just brushed them aside, mm -hmm. you know, until, I guess it would have been like after that year that I worked for him where I was really starting to go, mm. but I didn't want to think that he ever had bad intentions with me because that was just like really painful. Because he never did mm -hmm. try anything on me, but I, looking back, I think he was certainly grooming me. But I was lucky enough to, I got fired. <laughs> you got fired as his assistant, or like his potential next fifth wife or fourth wife or whatever. <laughs> both, both, thank God. <laughs> I think by being fired as his assistant, it saved me from being his potentially chosen fourth wife, but. No, I got fired because I wasn't making enough money and um, I was going into massive debt. And like I said, he didn't do shit. So I was just like bored doing nothing, uh -huh. hardly anything. Although I watched their baby two days a week, also on the church's dime. Um, so I got a job waitressing on the side, but I didn't submit it. I didn't ask for permission and I got in trouble. And um, I was called by one of the TLW leaders and said, you know, we're letting you go because we can't justify paying you people's hard earned tithe money when you're not there full time. And I was like, okay. <laughs> we can't justify paying you below minimum wage. Yeah. To, to or we're paying Rick some big salary to do absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's wild. I mean, he that's a it's a clear example of how he can use his access and status and the the power of the church and the money and et cetera, et cetera, to audition future wives or just affairs or whatever he wanted. Um and then groom and, and take young people well, yeah. and I was brainwashed into thinking like like I said, Gary and Marilyn justified everything he did and they would do it in such a way that especially for someone young, you're like, oh, well, OK, so I guess that was all on the up and up and I shouldn't mm -hmm. worry about it. You know, that's where I was yeah. at because I hate to even say, oh, I thought he was, you know, a decent guy at the time. But there are always those things that you those questions you push aside because you don't know what to do with them or they convince yeah. you you're you're oh, you don't know. You just don't know. You're seeing it wrong. Where do you think you would be today? Maybe not today. Where do you think you would have been, you know, October, early October 2018, had you uh, 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 not left the church? I know it sounds dramatic, but I don't, I don't know if I'd still be alive. Like I was so 
depressed and self-loathing. I mean, when I was living in LA at the church there, the, the second time I lived in LA, I started cutting myself. Like I was just in such a dark place because I think all of those years of just being just put down constantly and you know, you're never good enough. You're always bad, always wrong and the extreme control. I did become like, you know, um, suicidal and like trying to, as the years went on, like trying to, to deal with the repercussions of all the abuse, but not even understanding the abuse, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's all I ever knew. And, um, I got, I think if I hadn't gotten out, like, it just, I would have self-destructed, I think. But because I got out, I was able to start the process of really healing and, you know, getting help and go going to therapy to help un unpack all of this stuff and understand, like, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and, you know, being able to see the truth about what they really did to all of us. Uh, yeah, I can't yeah. imagine where I would have been. What would you, what would you tell? Cause I don't even know, like, what would you tell yourself or, or what would you tell somebody who was in a similar situation where they felt really stuck and they felt really, um, you know, if they think they're in a cult or abusive relationship or something like that, what, what would your advice be to mm. them? I would say if you think that you're in a cult or you think you're in an abusive relationship, then you are and get out as fast as you can and heal from it, work on it, work on healing it. Because if you don't, you'll just find yourself in the same situation with a different face or a different organization. Like you have to heal those parts of yourself that was, you know, drawn to that toxic relationship in the first place or that was, um, you know, drawn into a cult. Obviously, it's a little different for those of us that were born into the cult. We weren't drawn into it, but that thinking is there now. And so it's easy to magnetize similar dynamics relationally. Trust your intuition, trust your instincts. Like, you know, if something feels off, it's off. Just trust that, trust your gut. That's, a, that's, that's very true about like, you have to heal yourself because if you don't, you'll just, you'll find another community or relationship or whatever that fits the same mold of the place that you just escaped okay. and the people that you just escaped. And you'll just find yourself recreating that your entire life because especially if you're born into it like us, you don't know anything else. And so unless you change that therapy or yoga or both mm -hmm. um, or whatever, that it's, it's just going to follow you around. Um, can I ask you one more question? We can, we can cut this out if you want. Yeah. Uh, but just out of curiosity, because I've asked a lot of people, what do you believe today? Do mm -hmm. you, like, where do you end up after coming out and now you get to make your own decision about religion, Jesus, whatever, like, where did you, where have you landed? Or are you still trying to figure that out? That it's been an interesting process. Cause at first, you know, uh, where I was when I first left is different than where I am now. Like, I don't even like, I want nothing to do with organized religion ever. Um, I would say I still believe in God, but I don't even like to call it God because that's a triggering word for me now. I don't, I have to use a different word because the way that the Living Word Fellowship associated God with like, it was just all negative. It was, I don't, I can't eliminate that association yet. And so I call it the universe or source or the great spirit. Like, but for me, it's more, I guess it sounds so cliche, but I would say I'm like spiritual, not religious. I, I'm more into like kind of Eastern philosophies and not in like a new agey way, but just like a, it's all in here. It's all in me. I don't need some medi mediary, is mediary a word? <laughs> Between me and whatever's out there. It's like, I don't need somebody telling me what to believe or how to be. It's just like being in touch with my soul and my true essence. Bye-bye religion. And I also don't believe in the Bible at all. 
I feel like I could go for hours about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bye bye religion. Um, that's a, that's a good, that's a good one. Um, thank you. This was awesome. You, I think, I mean, we talked about a lot of stuff and you really helped, you know, hearing these kind of things. Cause it's hard to explain what this stuff was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you for what you did for Shalom and being there to help her and support her. Um, because ultimately, you know, that little team work and, you know, the team you talked about, all everybody that came together to be supportive in there that changed so many people's lives um, and helped so many people. And I know, um, I know that a li- at least a little bit, you know, of, of the thanks should go to you too, for being supportive of her. It's the thing I'm most proud of in my whole life. So <laughs> and I think- you should be, that's awesome. That's really cool. I like that. <laughs> I was scared shitless, but like, thanks to Shalom. I, I don't know. She's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty amazing. I, I, I really, the first time we watched, I sat down and just like put all those videos in order. I was just like, Oh my God, these women are so inspiring. Uh, Just Mm -hmm. the, you know, it was like, you just had like all the right words and like said everything just like boom, 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 just like called it all out. And Shalom was just like, I'm doing this (laughs) It's happening and they are going to pay, you know, it was great. It was really great. That's I love hearing that. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're doing all this because it's, I don't know. It's pretty amazing. And I wanted to tell you too, um, I posted the video on my Facebook and I have a lot of friends that are people I went to high school with that were not in the church, but of course, like knew about it and they've been Uh commenting and watching. So I think that's really powerful for people who still live in that area or have family and like knew Shiloh to spread the word. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Time to, time to spread the word. What do you call it? The, uh, Word for the world. Oh, that's, God. Uh, that's what we're doing here. <laughs> Trigger alert. <laughs> yeah, watch out. <laughs> that was an interview with Charity. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this and want more content like this. I can bring in other former members who would love to tell you all about the Living Word cult, their personal experiences, and more and more about Gary and Marilyn and John and Rick and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Goodbye.